you know, the 30s is a serious decade. Yeah. But it's also a beautiful time because I think as a woman, especially, I feel really confident and I know what I want, I know who I am. Mm -hmm. And um, just moving into like owning it. Yeah. Well, we're hitting our sexual peak. Totally. <laughs> Which <laughs> We're just giant perverts, guys. <laughs> neighborhood of LA and I'm going to be meeting with Bat for Lashes aka Natasha Khan. Natasha Khan does more than write imaginative emotional pop songs. She's a meticulous artist. From her videos to her art to the themes and stories woven within, the English singer's attention to detail has been critical to her impact. Since emerging in 2006, Khan's released three albums, been twice nominated for the UK's Mercury Prize, and scored her biggest hit with Daniel, which earned her the Ivor Novella Award for songwriting excellence. She's also found time to write and direct a short film and release an experimental psych record under the name Sex Witch. Now she's back with her fourth album, The Bride, and Khan has a new narrative in mind, one involving a bride widowed at the altar. Still grief-stricken, the bride decides to head out on the road trip her groom planned for their honeymoon. These songs capture a woman moving through grief on a journey of self-discovery. But it's also a metaphor for the emphasis we put on finding that certain someone to complete the picture. As always with Bat for Lashes, the beauty and nuance is in the layers beneath the surface. Natasha, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So the new record is called The Bride. Yes. Yeah. And I was curious about what the kernel of inspiration was for that. It was that Neil Craig, the photographer, and I had done some shoots together and we were sending each other like reference imagery of just ideas and stuff back and forth. And there was one of a woman in a veil and it was black and white and really spooky. I just remember texting him just going, my next album's going to be called The Bride. You know, and those sorts of things just... You have to subconsciously accept yeah. <laughs> the, the muse that's trying to come through. So um, I want people to go deeper and I want them to get involved in the story mm. and apply it to themselves and maybe like feel something a bit deeper than just this instant flash yeah. in the pan sort of thing. So I've spent two years developing this story and everything that goes along with it for that reason. Do you still believe in marriage as a... Construct. Construct. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I do, actually. The analogy in the album of death, like his death, so things dying and then, like, the cycle of life and things coming back again. I think in relationships we are losing that ability to see things through past the initial death of romance yeah. and then, like, into re real love and reality and, like, this person isn't perfect and especially in this day and age of throwaway culture and instant gratification and, and like... Tinder and stuff. I could just date someone else straight away, but actually, like, I might just sit with this person and see how it feels. So, mm. if you can say I've been married for like 30 years, I think, like, wow. What a that's fucking an achievement, achievement. especially yeah. in this kind of climate we live in. So, you know, there's a big death theme in the album, but not to be depressing or anything, it's a metaphor for moving through the stages. So, I do believe in marriage. I think it's like a soul's journey, it's hard. Yeah. I was with someone for seven or eight years and I just remember falling in love with them over and over again in loads of different ways. Yeah. And uh, that was my, like, abiding memory of that. And I, that's one of my fondest memories was, like, discovering different, deeper layers. Mm -hmm. When you finished Two Sons and then you were kind of trying to write The Haunted Man, I know that you kind of went through a period where you had a quite bad writer's block and you, yeah. were, and you were feeling a lot of pressure. How did your mindset compare once you came out of The Haunted Man and finished touring? You know, within each album, you have a cycle of whatever's happening. But when I look over all of them, the first one is like your whole life up until that point. So you're just ripe and the fruit just drops from the tree and it all just comes out. And then the second one, I felt like I'd gone into the world, met all these people and all these new flavours were coming in. So that was really nice to this kind of chemical process between who I was and this new person. And I think it's quite natural that then by the third album, I think there's kind of a, it is a bit of a difficult album because something happened where I felt I kind of lost myself and I didn't quite know where I fit anymore. And I, I kind of spent that many years 
giving out and I didn't know what I had to say. My own personal experience of, of kind of coming out of my 20s and then going into my 30s, I found that like a bit of a weird spot where yeah. I did lose my sense of self. And I was like, what am I doing with my life? Do I still care about the things that I used to care about? I do agree, like in the, at the end of your 20s, you move into a really weird space. Don't ever date someone that's 29, because it's a <laughs> nightmare. Because they're going to go, ah, and like change everything. Yeah. And uh, it is that time where you just suddenly realise you, you're not a child anymore. And, you, you know, the 30s is a serious decade. Yeah. But it's also a beautiful time because I think as a woman, especially, I feel really confident and I know what I want. I know who I am. Mm -hmm. And um, just moving into, like, Owning it. Yeah. Well, we're hitting our sexual peak. Totally. <laughs> Which <laughs> just giant perverts, guys. <laughs> we're like rubbing up on tables. Can't get enough. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it's weird though. I genuinely like. <laughs> it's like your body's last ditch attempt. Like, oh my god. <laughs> It's definitely like, it was like shocking to me. I mean, I know because they're always like, oh yeah, when you hit your mid-30s, you're totally hitting your sex. I was like, yeah, whatever, guys, whatever. And then I'm Men like, hit it at like 18, yeah. it's over. We're totally mismatched. We need to, we, well, we don't want to go with 18 year olds. No, we can't do that. <laughs> but now I don't know who we're supposed to date. Yeah, you're like, I'm what's like, going I'm on? really, I'm, yeah. But yeah, funny. the peak is definitely happening um, in more ways than one. But I think, yeah, you feel it's your sexual peak, but also I just feel in terms of confidence and... It is a blossoming, like, I feel like I've kind of fully blossomed. Yeah. And it's a sort of weird terror as well, because then, like, the next stage is different. Like, mm -hmm. you've kind of reached the apex in some ways. Before you were doing The Haunted Man, which was your last record, you did take some ayahuasca. You went on an ayahuasca journey, which, honestly, I cannot tell you how many of my friends are, like, going and doing this. Yeah. And I don't know whether it's just because we are so plugged in constantly and now everybody's trying to find, Plug like, out. yeah, and, like, a centered <laughs> self in. or, like, I don't I was just curious about what your experience was of, of that. It's a really beautiful ceremony and I did it with an Argentinian shaman and a Native American chief and his wife and they did all the beautiful Native American songs and dances with the eagle feathers and stuff it was I was off my face just watching them <laughs> just like you know doing oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. all of that and it was just it was beautiful and they were telling really ancient stories about the planet and it pulls away all the veils of bullshit and you're just completely raw and exposed mm. I think you definitely need to go in with an objective that you want to do some really deep healing. It's definitely not recreational and it's not fun. Yeah. It was a nightmare, like a living nightmare. But I did come out the other side feeling I'd purged a lot and kind of worked through some stuff, but I don't think I probably will ever do it again. Really? Yeah, it's... I know there's people who kind of get addicted to doing it over and over again. I feel like that might be just substituting one addiction for another or just like a way of maybe not kind of being in this world. Mm -hmm. And I find it quite hard to be in this world because I'm off, you know, with the planets most of the time anyway. Yeah. So I'm kind of looking for things to ground me more. Lately, I've been doing uh, TM, Transcendental Meditation. I find for me that's a much more practical day-to-day -day tool that's quite grounding yeah. and lets me kind of, kind of ground myself and be in the world so I can then spend so much time in my imagination. You have such a like gentle speaking voice and your singing voice has such an incredible clarity and I find you quite calming, but it's, <laughs> it's true. Thanks. But it's surprising to me then that when you were a kid that you got suspended for swearing at a teacher and chucking a chair at them or something. What happened? <laughs> What's your, such a I was a rebel. I was a very angry, rebellious teenager. Mm -hmm. I used to bunk off school and go up to London, go out clubbing. I danced at the Ministry of Sound. I was like, what? off it and just didn't care. Yeah. And this boring suburban town that I was living in and this really strict school I went to where they spoke of art as a hobby and, mm -hmm. you know, and what are you going to fall back on and will you be a doctor or a lawyer? And it was that kind of... And it just wasn't me and I felt very misplaced. And then I kind of sort of sorted myself out around the age of 18. I went traveling and that's when I kind of really discovered that I wanted to do music or I wanted to be a painter or whatever it was that, that I kind of found my tribe and I just kind of calmed right down. And I think it's just 
if you're not in the right place, your soul just like is unhappy about it and just yeah. wants to kind of be angry. So I get it, you know. You recently premiered your film at the Tribeca Film Festival. Yes. Yeah. Congratulations. So it's, okay. it was a film that you wrote and directed, and it's part of six films about modern love. Yes. Called Madly. was that experience and how does that then tie to the bride because it's also about a bride <laughs> it's not the same story as the album but my kind of end goal with this is to do a feature length kind of musical or film that's of the bride story how do you stay inspired why do you keep doing this <sighs> i don't know i think i feel like it keeps doing me <laughs> I don't feel like it's a choice. Yeah. And sometimes I get tired and I think, yeah, why am I doing this? But then I do it and it's a beautiful thing and I love my life. How do you feel now that you have stepped back from The Bride and it's like, you know, the recording's done? I feel really proud of it as a piece of work and I, I feel it's the one I've been the most kind of closely involved with in terms of every intricate detail of like how it flows and the story and like, it's just, it really is such a fully formed baby. Like mm. it's this thing and so I feel very um, close to it and I feel like really tender about it. I feel really proud and really happy. I think it's a good record. It is a good record. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't usually say that, but I Blow do. your own trumpet. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. No, I'm just happy. Yeah, yeah. good. I'm yeah. glad. Thanks so much for Thank joining you. me. Nice to see you. You too. <laughs>